Okay, our next reader. This person actually failed and had to retake first grade because they couldn't read at all. And they can read now, but very slowly. <laughs> Who do you think it is, Michael or Brett? Brett. I don't know, everyone knew that. Yes. <laughs> Brett Finlayson, everyone. And also... <laughs> Also, he not only can read, but he can write. His recent stories have appeared in Beloit Fiction Journal, Akashic Books, Mondays or Murder Series, and Juked. Thank you. Thank you, Lorinda. Um, it's pathetic, but it's true. I really couldn't read. It was kind of bad, but... Um, it's, it's, honestly, it's true, too. It's really slow. <laughs> I can't read that well. I'm like... ADD of like the century. I have to like walk around the house every time I read a sentence. So, um, all right. Um, I'm going to read a really uh, short piece that I wrote a few years ago. Um, sort of forgot about, lost it, and then sort of like stumbled upon it in my computer when I was backing up my files and sort of rewrote it. And um, that's it. So this is called The Book of Decades. She lies in a hospital bed, skin orange with jaundice and a stint hanging from her hip. There's something wooden about this place, she thinks. Down the hall, a door opens and a television is discussing international trade agreements. Someone is afraid to sleep. The wet meandering of hospital slippers across the corridor, a horse's tongue along the rosy exterior of a child's palm. The morphine makes melted plastic of her memories, molding them into tiny pictures that she hangs on the wall beside her bed. This machine keeps beeping. A man enters his skin smooth and pale. He is the walker. His knees buckle under the weight of a book he carries on his back, the book of decades. Inside, he shows her Henry Ford, the First World War, and the Great Depression. He shows her John Dillinger. He shows her Amelia Earhart's plane, a glint of sunlight moving across the Pacific Ocean. He shows her other things, too. Jackie Robinson, and an old western with James Coburn. He shows her the floating body of Valentina Tereshkova, the first woman to ever go to space. The man is wearing a tuxedo the color of dried dirt. It chafes every time he turns a page, but he turns them slowly, giving her time to see everything. After they've read the book of decades, which ends to be continued, dot, dot, dot. He lifts his head up to look at her, and his beaked nose seems familiar, a nose that reminds her of someone she was in love with. If somebody drew the nose of the man that she was in love with, and that drawing had tiny, nearly imperceptible imperfections, it would be this nose, the nose of the man who carries the book of decades. You look afraid, he says. I am, she says. He nods. Have you seen all your children? Gregory flew in from California this morning, she says. He's lost weight. He looks healthy. That should take a load off. This isn't right, this beeping, she says. Can you page a doctor? What doctor? They've all gone home to their families. She closes her eyes, but the television distracts her. Bonds. The television is talking about bonds. She remembers learning how to swim when her father threw her into Bearsley Pond and left her there. And years later, when she and some friends walked the sandbars out to Charles Island, and on the return, the tide rolled back in, and Long Island Sound filled up to their waists. And in that cloudy water, she felt the hand touch her leg, a boy nobody knew, an unclaimed boy. I wore this tuxedo in my wedding 67 years ago. The man poses for her, holding onto the lapels. My son brought it to me. He thinks I'm crazy. His eyes are pin sharp. When we see our children now, he says, we can only wave. She scans the pictures on the wall. Niagara Falls from the Canadian side. An oak tree felled by a bolt of lightning. She's watching the pictures, but they keep changing. I think we can talk to each other, she says. We can talk to each other. We have to talk to each other, he says. She closes her eyes again. And when she opens them, she's sitting beside a boy, a boy with the same nose as the man who carries the book of decades. They're at a fair on the beach. 
sitting side by side on a blue Ferris wheel. The metal bar locks into place and the boy smiles, his teeth too big for his mouth. All aboard, all aboard, yells the ride operator, a bushy black mustache wrapping around three sides of his mouth. Last call, all aboard. The Ferris wheel jolts backwards and the mechanical arm raises them into the sky. Flying frogs and rusted metal lily pads come into view. She points them out to the boy. There's bold goldfish, oversized stuffed animals with black smiles and broom whiskers, cotton candy. In the distance, that small island. Seeing how much she's enjoying everything, the boy gives her binoculars. She looks through the glass at the magnified lights flashing across the sky. Heat lightning, he tells her. It's safe. She looks through the binoculars again, thinking it would be possible to see this carnival from outer space. Up, up, going up. Almost at the top, she looks down and sees Gregory, her son. Where did he come from? He lifts a wooden mallet above his head, and it pauses at the top of its swing. When gravity and the hammer's upward momentum have equaled each other in force, and for one instant, the heavy object is completely weightless. Look, she says, offering the boy the binoculars. It's Gregory. But the boy doesn't take the binoculars. His face has changed, his nose. He turns them around and gives them back to her. This is the way they go now, he says. And when she looks through them again, Gregory is just a tiny white dot in the sand. Thank you.